Uh, we're going to simply call this message the hardest things. The hardest things. I'm going to show you seven hard things that are going to come bubbling up from this text. And we're going to see Jesus in all of those hard things. There are going to be hard things that we as disciples have to embrace, hard things that we have to accept, but we accept them all and we embrace them all as we follow after Jesus. Jesus did hard things and he allows us to do some hard things as well. So let me take you into this text. Here in chapter number 12 of this great gospel of John, here's what's just happened. Jesus has just raised Lazarus from the dead. I said Jesus has just raised Lazarus from the dead. It's a big deal. And the people back then understood that this was a big deal. Jesus, up to this point, had done a lot of miraculous things. He had shown himself to truly be the Messiah, to be the anointed one sent from God. He had turned water into wine. Jesus had walked upon the water. He had fed multitudes with uh, only some scraps. Jesus had made a man who was born blind. He allowed that man to see, but this one, Bringing Lazarus up from the grave, that one hit different. It hit so different that it caused the multitudes to kind of take a step back and to kind of see, you know what, this, there's something otherworldly about what this Jesus just did. And so they started hanging out. They started hanging around, not just to see Jesus, but to see this man who was dead, who was now walking around alive. Let me tell you something. All they got to do is hang around a little bit longer. They're about to see another one get up under his own power. And so these folks, they start gathering and they gather as Jesus is walking into Jerusalem. And they start saying, Hosanna, they, this plea of salvation that they are uttering, save us now. They are acknowledging that Jesus is the one who can offer such deliverance, that Jesus is the one who can save them now. They know at this point in time that Jesus is indeed the Messiah. And this is what Jesus has been trying to prove for three years. This is the moment, the moment that the disciples likely had been waiting for. This is the best of all things. The best of all things was for them to confess who Jesus actually was. He'd been trying to prove it, and now they see it. It's the best of everything, all coming to fruition in this moment. North Boulevard, we've experienced some of the best of all things. Back in 2013, my goodness, a, a, a vision was cast. And eventually as that vision was cast, you started casting pledges to support that vision. At $12.4 million was pledged in one day to help make disciples here, near, and far. Do you know how many churches would love for, for how many preachers and elders would love for their churches to respond to such a vision in such a big and bold and faithful way? See, this amount of money is not pledged just simply because you got it. It's pledged because you got faith in the one who gave it. You showed your faith that day and you pledged it. And it started shaking and reverberating all around the world. Like, I wasn't going here when, when that day uh, happened. I wasn't going here, but I heard about it. Because everybody heard about it. Because this is what you want. This is what you want to be a part of. Some of you came to North Boulevard because of this vision. This is what every church should want. 
And then God just started using it, started using those funds. Do you know, do you know that since that day and, and, and over the, the course of time, 3,172 churches have been planted because of you, because of this church. That's the greatest of all things. Everyone would want that. But church, sometimes, and Jesus is about to show us this, Sometimes the best of things are followed by the hardest things. Followed by things that you didn't see coming. The things that you saw coming, followed by the things you didn't see coming. You can't set a mark like that without Satan saying, oh, okay, I see what you're trying to do. Now let me throw some stuff at you. And usually he doesn't throw easy stuff at us. That's just not how it works. The best of things are often followed by the hardest of things. Jesus has been claimed or hailed as Messiah as he's walked in. That's the best of things, but that's about to be followed by the hardest of things. But if we hold on and keep following Jesus, the hardest of things, are sometimes followed by some of the best things. Okay, absolutely. You got to wait for it. The hardest of things, amen. They're followed by some of the best things. Let me show you what I'm talking about uh, through this text. We're going to go to work in verse number 20. Here, this is from the English Standard Version that I'm reading from. We read these words. Now among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks, the apostle tells us about. So there were some Greeks, some Gentiles, some non-Jews who went up to the Jewish feast of the Passover. Now these Greeks uh, could have been some sort of proselytes or they could have just been some general Gentile God-fearers. We don't know exactly who they are, and we don't exactly know why they are there, but we do know this. As they are there, they want to see Jesus. Let me make this a little personal for you. So right now, there's someone in your life who's looking to you so that they can see Jesus. You are the disciple in someone's life in this moment, and you're there to help them see Jesus. Well, these Greeks are there, and they want to see Jesus, and so they come to one of Jesus' disciples, whose name happens to be Philip, verse 21. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and they asked him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. So their plea is a polite one. But the Greek, the original Greek language of the tense says that their plea was also a persistent one. So they came to Philip and said, sir, we wish to see Jesus. And then maybe a minute later, they come right back to Philip. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Maybe 10 minutes passed and then they come back, sir, we wish to see Jesus. Maybe 30 minutes, maybe an hour. I don't know how long it went on, but they were persistent. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Not just see him, but talk to him. We want to interview him. We want to discover something about Jesus, something from Jesus. Now, why would they keep going back to Jesus? Why would they need to be persistent? Well, the inference is that Philip doesn't take him to Jesus. And why might not Philip take him to Jesus? Well, Philip might be feeling a certain kind of way about taking them to Jesus. He might not really know quite what to do. It might sound simple for you and I. They want to see Jesus, just take them to Jesus. But there seems to be an inferred tension that Philip is feeling 
that's preventing him from taking them to Jesus. I got seven hard things from this text. Here's hard thing number one. It's something that all disciples, all of us have to embrace and follow Jesus through it. Here's hard thing number one. Disciples must live in the tension of not always knowing what to do or where to go. You heard that statement and you might say to yourself, I don't really know what to do with that. And there might not be any ready answers for you right away of what to do with that. Welcome to the club. Such as being a disciple. There are going to be times when we have to live in the tension of not knowing what to do or where to go. But as long as you follow Jesus, you can rest assured that he knows what to do and he knows where to go. So we just follow him through it. Now, I wouldn't blame Philip for not really understanding because he's heard some things from Jesus that have kind of changed and shifted over time just based upon Jesus's mission. Number one, Philip had heard something like this in Matthew chapter number 10, verse 5 through 6. These 12, Philip's part of that 12, Jesus sent them out on a mission trip. But here was the instruction, go nowhere amongst the Gentiles or the Greeks. Don't go to them, at least not yet. Don't enter any town of the Samaritans. Here's what you are to do. Here's where you are to go. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Well, these Greeks who are saying, sir, we want to see Jesus, they're not part of the the lost sheep of the house of Israel. They are those Gentiles whom he was told don't go to them at that point in time. So he might be scratching his head and saying, I don't really know what to do. I don't know where to go with this. But he's also seen Jesus in Matthew 15, verses 22 through 27. A Canaanite, a non-Jewish woman came to Jesus and was asking Jesus to heal his demon-oppressed, uh, her demon-oppressed daughter. Uh, she comes to him, but Jesus, verse 23, didn't even answer her a word. He didn't even respond to the woman's request. But he eventually said that I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But between her coming and between him saying that, the disciples, Philip being one of them, was trying to send her away. No, that's not our mission right now. We're not trying to help her right here, right now, right here and there. We, we don't want to do that. But then she kept being persistent. And then Jesus eventually said to her, O oh woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desired. Her daughter was healed immediately. So Philip sees this. But he remembered that they weren't to go, but Jesus, he healed her daughter because she was persistent. These Greeks, they're being persistent. I don't really know what to do with that. So what do we do when we don't know what to do? We go to our friends. And that's what he did. He goes to Andrew. Hey, Andrew, these Greeks are wanting to see Jesus. I don't really know what to do with this. What, we, what should we do? And Andrew and, and Philip, they they collaborate and they decide to bring the request to Jesus. Verse 22, Philip went and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. So they get to Jesus. Hey, Jesus, we have some Greeks here. We don't really know why they're here. We don't know much about them, but they want to see you. And and Jesus, they've been really persistent. I don't really know what to do with it. We're bringing it to you. Uh, they want to see you. And so how does Jesus answer them? Jesus doesn't say, okay, bring them, bring them here. Uh, send them to me. He doesn't say, give me five minutes and then I'll see them. He doesn't say, send them away now and then bring them back and then we'll deal with whatever their issue is. He doesn't say any of this. What does he say? How does he respond? Verse 23, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Jesus, the Greeks want to see you, okay? The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. They might say, okay, um, the Greeks. You remember, we came for the Greeks. They want to see you. I heard you. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Now is the time. It's cross time. It's hard time. 
difficult time. That is upon me. Now, I don't know what they do with that, but it introduces us to hard thing number two, that you got to realize when you and as you walk with Jesus, the Lord doesn't always respond in ways we might expect. He doesn't. And you should keep praying and be persistent in your prayers. But you got to know, and this is hard to accept, the Lord doesn't always respond in ways we might expect. Here's what I used to believe until I read this. I used to believe that God, that the Lord answered us in one of three ways. One, he can show you that his answer to your request is a straight up yes. Okay? Sometimes it can be pretty immediate. Number two, he can show you that your answer to his request, to your request, is a straight up no. You ain't getting it. Quite often, we see the third one, where his response to your request is, wait for it. Just wait. Just wait. Might be tomorrow, might be a month, might be a year. But he's showing you his answer is wait. But after reading this, I see there's a fourth potential answer. And that fourth potential answer or response is something that you just didn't even see coming. That he took you down a road that you didn't even imagine. That he brought something up. He answered you in a way that was totally way off. Didn't seem to have any sort of connection to what you were asking. He's done that a lot in my life once I sit and think about it. He can just show you something that's way different. But whatever he shows you and wherever he takes you, is going to be good. It's going to end up being great. The hour has come. And what's so different about this is because prior to this, Jesus had made a point of always talking about it wasn't time. Back in John 2 and verse number 4, when his mother comes to him about the, being, uh, having the wine, uh, the wine had, they had run out of wine at the wedding feast, Jesus says, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. In uh, John chapter 7, verse number 30, they were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. John 8 and 20, these words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, but no one arrested him because his hour had not yet come. But the hour has come, and the time for difficulty has arisen. That all the time of teaching and all the time of theory and all the time of predicting, here's what's going to happen. Now they are facing it. Now they're in the thick of it. See, North Boulevard, we, we've pledged and we've planned and we've done some things. But right here, right now, we find ourselves in the thick of it. And it doesn't always feel good. It's easy to plan, and it's easy to pray, and it's easy to prepare. But now we're in a situation you got to fight and remain and wait and trust and follow. And if you follow, if you keep on following, you'll find that there may be a blessing that you never even counted on. And you had to go through the fire in order, order to be forged for the blessing. Because following Jesus disrupts stuff. Some people, you know, sign up for this just wanting the blessing. No, nah, you got the blessing, there's going to be some disruption. Jesus speaks about it all through his ministry. But that's hard thing number three. Jesus disrupts the way things were. He talks about dying here. That's going to disrupt the way things were. 
We were hanging out with Jesus. We were eating with Jesus the best of uh, everything. All of this has come to us, but now he's talking about going away, and that's going to disrupt some things, and it's going to make their lives very uncomfortable. But if they keep following, it's going to be a blessing in it. So he likens this, this whole situation to a seed being planted in the ground says, verse 24, truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat, a seed, falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He looks at himself like that, as a seed that has to be planted in the earth. I got to die. And if I die, I'll bear much fruit. The mission that I'm on is bigger than me. The mission we're on is bigger than you. It's bigger than me. It's bigger than whomever stands in a pulpit. The mission is bigger. But something has to be disrupted sometimes in order for there to be growth. When you plant a seed in the ground and you water that seed, well, that seed begins, things begin to become disrupted. The seed breaks and begins to break down, and uh, life starts to grow from that seed, and it has to be uh, disrupt the earth that it grows through. And if it gets through all of the disruption, life can be seen, and life can bloom, and life can give life to other folks. Walking with Jesus does not mean your life will be comfortable. It'll probably mean just the opposite. But if you keep following, you'll see a blessing. And it's hard thing number four that I want you to see right now. One of the hardest things about following Jesus is to embrace what he says here in verse number 25 and 26. Whoever loses his life, or excuse me, whoever loves his life, loses it. Whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If you love life just the way it is and you just want to hold on to life just the way it is, you're going to wind up losing your life. If you just want to have enjoyment and ease and comfort and you're going to do whatever is necessary so that you can have enjoyment, ease, and comfort, you might lose your life. You will lose your life. But if you surrender your life in pursuit of King Jesus, then you will truly experience what abundant life actually is. But to experience life, you've got to die to your old life. You've got to die to self. That's hard. It's a hard thing to do. And it's something that the American church hasn't been good at promoting. You know, we talk about, you know, come and receive. But as Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, when Jesus bids a man to come, he bids him to come and die. We got to learn the practice of dying to self, getting self out of the middle. Dying to self is showing love when you haven't been shown love. Dying to self is praying for those who persecute you. Dying to self is turning the other cheek and going the extra mile. Dying to self is letting love rule over everything, even the things that you might not really understand. Dying to self is letting mercy and grace dominate, again, even in the things that you don't quite understand. You might not understand this. You might not understand that statement, but you've got to let love rule, and you've got to let mercy and grace dominate. That's what dying to self is. And Jesus calls us all to do that. And we do it because he did it. He died, so we die to ourselves. Isn't this what Jesus meant in Luke chapter 9, verses 23 and 24? And he said to all, if anyone will come after me, you're going to follow me. you got to learn to deny yourself. It's not about you. Get yourself out of the center and take up his cross daily. The cross is a cross of suffering a cross of hardship. Whatever your hardship is, whatever your suffering is, you take it along with you as you follow Jesus. We don't stop. 
because it's gotten difficult. We don't stop because we're dealing with hardships. We don't stop when difficulties invade our lives. We don't stop when we don't understand everything. We don't stop because all of our questions aren't answered. We don't stop because Jesus says, go. And we keep on going. And we keep on following. Because that's what disciples do. For whoever would save his life will lose it. Whatever who, whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. Sur uh, surrounded Paul's theology when he said in Galatians 2 and 20, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. It's not about me. It's Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, the life I live in the everyday, I live my everyday life in faith. Faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So when all of the difficulties, the hard things come, I, I, I'm living by faith. I'm living by faith in Jesus because I know he loves me. And because he loves me, he's not going to let me down. He's not going to leave me. I could leave him, but he's not going to leave me. And as long as I stay with him, I know I'm going to be all right. Die to self. And if we learn to die to self, we can experience something amazing. But to experience the amazing, the ordinary has to die. Your lives might be great, but they are ordinary in comparison to the life that Jesus offers you. To have the amazing life that Jesus offers, the ordinary has to die. Why wouldn't you trade ordinary for amazing? We don't often because it's hard to do. But you know what I believe North Boulevard can do? Hard thing number five, I believe you can run toward the difficult. Because Jesus did. He says in verse 27, Now my soul, or now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I've come to this hour. For this purpose, I've come to this. I, I'm not going to say, get me out of this, because I was built for this. I was born for this. I can do this, because I don't do this on my own. I do this with my Father. I can do this. And whatever your hardship is, you can do this. How does North Boulevard respond to a statement like that? We can do this. And we do this not because uh, we're just so great. We can do this because God is so great. We have one another. We have God. And we don't know exactly what God is going to do, but we trust in him. Jesus says, I, I got this, and I can do this. For this purpose, I have come. He's about to face something that has his soul troubled. It's not his mind that's troubled. It's not his body that's troubled. It's his soul. It's his very being. He feels trouble. Trouble because he's about to experience what 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For our sake... He being the Father made him, being the Son, to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He was going to have your sin on his shoulders. And for a time, he was going to be separated from his Father because of that. But he did all of that so that you might be declared righteous, so that you might be declared not guilty. Praise God Almighty Praise God. for that. But it didn't stop him. Because he wanted to do what he was doing for the glory of the Father. Father, verse 28, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I've glorified it, and I will glorify it again. God is about his glory. The thing that separates us from from Jesus, and really will, it'll change your life if, when you learn to adopt this, 
Jesus didn't do what he did for his comfort. He did what he did for the Father's glory. When we start living our lives for the Father's glory, then you will see changes in your life. When you approach every challenge that you have, that this challenge is going to be used for the Father's glory, it'll change your whole perspective on challenges. I'm not saying you're going to always want the challenge. You're not always going to welcome the challenge. Challenges interrupt us. Challenges make us feel uncomfortable. But what if we said, you've given me this, and I'm going to use this for your glory. You've given me this diagnosis, so be it. Can't change it. But this diagnosis, Lord, let this, be, this diagnosis be for your glory. You've thrown something at me that I didn't see coming. So be it. Can't do anything about it now, but let me use this for your glory. You walked in here today. You didn't expect a statement to be read. It was read. There's nothing really we can do about it. We can continue to pray on it, but some of it's out of our hands. But dear God, let that statement and the words of that statement and the contents of that statement be used for your glory. And I know he'll do it. So hard thing number six, live for the glory of the king. Let it be about his glory. I told first service that um, I was watching the uh, press conference of a, of a fight that happened last night. It was a boxing uh, fight that happened last night, boxing match um, between Yusick and Fury, Tyson Fury for the undisputed championship of the world. Prior to the fight, they interviewed Tyson Fury, and he said, you know what, uh, I, I'm going to do my best, my opponent's going to do his best, and I'm just hoping that whatever I do is for the glory of God. I respected that. So he goes in, and he loses. He gets knocked down for like the first time ever. And he loses the undisputed championship of the world. And so they interview him and say, you know, uh, Tyson, you know, what happened? He said, well, really, I thought I won the fight. But it wasn't in my hands. I did all I could do. And all I wanted it to be was for God's glory. And I lost the fight. So be it. But as long as it was for the glory of God, I'm satisfied with it. Even though it didn't go the way I wanted it. See, in, 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 in life, especially in church life, things don't always go the way we want. Okay, they don't, they don't always go the way we want. But can they be used for the glory of God? Okay? Let me just be real with you. I didn't say this in first service. This is a bonus for you, second service. See, some of you, you would rather... And, and, and believe me, I'm, I'm not saying, I, I'm, I'm not saying, I'm not saying anything. I'm not reading into anything. I just, I just know, I just know people. I know how I would be, okay? Some would love for this sermon to be delivered by David Young. I don't take any offense in that. I, 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 one of the reasons I came here was because of David Young. But that's not what we have today. It's not what we have on, in this minute in this hour. But can it be used for the glory of God? Yes. See, I think it can if we ask him to use it for the glory of God. And I don't know what God is going to do with it, but I believe he'll do something great with it because it'll be for his glory. Yes. It'll be for his glory. Again, I don't say that. I'm not, I'm, I'm not trying to offend. I just, and, and I'm not offended because I, I understand how it is like you come, up, come to a place because there's a certain person at a place. And when a certain person's not at a place, you feel a certain kind of way. That's just real. I get it. I've been there, done that, sat where you're sitting. But if we take our hands off of it, get ourselves out of the center of it, and say, God, I don't know what you're doing with it, but let it be for your glory. Oh, it's going to be beautiful in the end if it's for his glory. But here's how I know it can, 
All challenging things can be beautiful or end up beautiful or with a blessing that we didn't count on. It comes from something that is brought out here. When the voice said, I will glorify it and I will glorify it again. Verse 30, Jesus said, this voice has come for your sake, not mine. But he says, now is the judgment of this world. Now will the ruler of this world be cast out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He says, as I'm lifted up, as I'm doing the hard thing, as I'm suffering for the sins of all mankind, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to draw all people to myself, but a great reversal is about to take place upon this earth, who he calls the ruler of this world, a a term that he is uh, using to describe Satan. He says he's going to be cast out. Prior to this, he'd been walking on this earth, and he's still walking on this earth to and fro, walking up and down on it. Peter says he's doing it, seeking whom he may devour, and he's still active. He is still trying to do what Satan does. But let me tell you, what Jesus did on the cross stripped him of all of the power that he had. It's gone. He's still active He has no power over you or over this church because there's another king. There's a new sheriff in town, and his name is Jesus. So no matter what he tries to do, as he tries to lie to you, as he tries to accuse you, tell you you're not worthy, telling you uh, that you're not going to make it, here's what you got to know. We can rejoice in what Paul said to the Roman church, that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. All that he's trying to do will fail. It's been toppled. There's a new king on the throne. He's ruling over this world. And so no matter what the hard thing is, you got to know you got a king who loves you, who sees you, who cares for you, and who is in control. And his name is Jesus. And this Jesus is telling you, you keep on walking. You just keep on walking. I got you. I'm running it. I'm sitting on the throne. I'm ruling. You just keep on walking. Don't stop. Don't stop. See, sometimes when announcements are read like this, it's natural to get jittery and maybe a little nervous. What are we going to do? Here's what we're going to do. Follow Jesus. And we ain't going to stop. We're going to keep walking. Because Jesus tells us to keep walking only by enduring Can we accomplish this mission? And Jesus is going to tell us, keep on walking. It's hard thing number seven. It's the last one. Keep on walking. Here's where he gets to this. So the people, the crowd, they're they're wondering, you know, we've heard from the law that Christ remains forever. Who is this son of man that you're talking about? Jesus says, the light, verse 35, the light is among you for a little while longer. Walk while you have the light lest darkness overtake you. The one who walks in darkness does not know where he is going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of the light. Again, he doesn't really respond to their question because the time for questions is over. You just got to decide you're going to walk or not going to walk. That's what he's telling them. And I want you to keep on walking. You're not going to always have your questions answered. We're not always going to have all the deep problems of life solved for us. But will you keep on walking? Because if you keep on walking, you can turn the challenge into a blessing. Romans 8, 28. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. We got a purpose. Make disciples. We love the Lord. So that means the good things work together with the bad things to produce the best thing in us. The easy works together with the difficult, with the hard. The things you understand work together with the things you don't understand. And they work together for our good as we follow after 
Jesus. Keep walking. Here's one thing I would call you to remember. We must follow Jesus into some hard things in this life. Walking with Jesus doesn't mean that we're, uh, we're divorced from comfort. It means that we are attached to some discomfort. That's all right. We follow him. Here's what I want to call you to obey. Do hard things because we can do them. You were made for this. The king was made for this. Together we can get through this. A way to apply this, seek ways to deny yourself. Get yourself out the center of your life. Put Jesus in the center of it. And he'll bless us beyond our wildest dreams. Think on these things as we together stand and sing.